Uh, zero off here. That. Huh? Wednesday morning live defensive handgun. Wednesday morning live handgun. Got my cool fire all fired up. Got my cool fire fired up. Hey, do you have your ultra appendix holster so we can show these awesome folks that are going to be jumping on in a minute your cool your appendix holster? I don't have it on me, brother. Okay, I've got the belt. I don't have the holster. All right, talk talk to people for just a second. I'm going to grab this one. Good morning to the four folks that are jumping on so far. Please like and hit that share button. Got a great Wednesday show for you this morning here on Shooting Performance Television. I got the notification that we're live, so people are going to start jumping on. Let me know who you are, where you're joining us from this morning. If you're a coined member of the American Warrior Society, please put that in today's show notes. If you've been listening to the American Warrior Show for a while, which is America's leading self-defense podcast, you probably know who I am. My name is Rich Brown, co-host. Co-founder of the American Warrior Society, American Warrior Show. And uh, I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer, et cetera, et cetera. And Mike Seeklander will be joining us in just a moment to talk about defensive handguns. He's got a good show for you. Uh, Mr. Will Parker is on. Good morning, my brother. John is on from Dallas, coin number 2230. Jared is on, another Montana uh, coined member, coin number 895. Raymond is on. John Shriver's on from, oh, look at that. Whoa, there he is. From Oklahoma. Tammy is on. Good morning, Tammy from Colorado. Got like 21 more? folks on, Mike. See my tactics? That's pretty sweet, bro. That's how I enter a room. I do a lot of this. You've been watching TV. Wow. we How many people have on right now? 23. Guile is on from the Philippines. Our good friend Brian Wall down there in Mississippi. Semper Fi brother Will Rhodes is on. 2269. If you want to know what a coin number is, man, we made it real easy for you this morning. Just click that top link of today's show notes. Cool. Rich, can I kick it off? Go for it. All right. Good morning, folks. Welcome to this morning's live stream. If you're joining me, you're probably watching on the American Warrior Society or the Shooting Performance Facebook page. So welcome. If you're a coin number, throw your coin member number up there. If you don't know what a coin is, Rich is going to show you a challenge coin here in a second. He better have his challenge coin. Hopefully he does. Number two, uh, today's material is, uh, it's, I think it's material that every single human that owns a handgun and plans on using it for self-defense should know. And to be honest with you, and well, oftentimes when we're teaching, we use a, uh, a statistic as a, an element of emotional appeal. Uh, if I had to guess, in all of the simulated um, micro drills I've done with students in our combative sessions, you know, years ago we used to run a bunch of them. I still do some of them with some students now, not as many. I would tell you across the board, unless the student is very well trained, probably 99% of them, or maybe even 100% of them, make a mistake in terms of distance considerations and gun positions. And I'm going to teach you all about that today in this live stream. Stream. It's going to be more of a lecture format. You, you won't probably be dry firing along with me, but you certainly welcome to uh, have your gun out and work on the position. So that said, let's talk about safety. If you're going to do the live stream with us today and have a, a firearm in the room or near you, please double check, make sure no live ammo, no loaded weapons. If you haven't unloaded the weapon or cleared the area of ammunition, do so now. Please don't continue this live stream. If you're not willing to follow all primary safety rules, please, all safety rules apply to and include the backstop safety rules. So if you're at a home and you're going to dry fire and pull the trigger, make sure you truly have a safe backstop in the area you're in. You assume all liability and risk for training with your firearm, not us. So please make sure you're going to comply. If not, once again, step away from this live stream, and I would hate to see you do that. Uh, I probably should have told you my name. For those of you that might see this and don't know who I am, my name is Mike Seeklander. I'm joined by, by of course, my buddy, long-term partner, co-host of the American Warrior Show, Mr. Rich Brown. Rich is going to wave. And uh, we'll, we're talking about distance considerations and firearm shooting positions today. Uh, of course, a couple more things. You know, we have a couple calls to action. If you're interested in the material, uh, Rich talked about getting your challenge coin. If you want to get your challenge coin, there's a link in the show notes. Uh, there's a challenge coin right there. By the way, for those of you that are coin members, there's a unique feature about the coin beyond the number. I want to see if one of you members can point out the unique feature with that coin that some of you may not know about. I can't hint any more than that. Some of you may know what it does. Some of you may not know what it does. 
Anyways, if you want to get your challenge coin, uh, click that link in the show notes. If you're on YouTube watching this later on, there's another link in the show notes. Same link. Please click the link and figure out. Uh, you can find out exactly what a challenge coin is, which is why the members jumping on are saying, hey, coin number 2188026. Bob Beal, you're number 26. Who gave Bob Beal coin number 26? Damn, I didn't know he was that low. Man, that's that's a low, low, low number coin. Um, anyways, if you want to find out what that is. Also, in terms of pure shooting position, if you go on uh, my primary website, that link is a little farther down. You're going to see a link to the defensive hanging and fundamentals. All of the programs, individual programs are on sale. But, of course, the material I'm teaching is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're going to be talking about, you know, how to manage distance in terms of, uh, another person, and if, like I said, if you're if you own a handgun, you plan on using it in self defense, whether or not you carry it full time, you need to know these techniques. You need to understand uh, the distance considerations. And I'm going to talk to you about five percent of it today. Okay, the other ninety five percent is in what we call the coin members vault. So if you want to learn uh, close quarter shooting position, how to manage recoil control from these close quarter positions, I'm going to show you today. Uh, how to retain your weapon, how to strip your, your weapon out of someone's hand if someone gets it in their hand. And these are all things, by the way, that I've learned from really high-level and esteemed instructors like uh, Craig Douglas, South Narc, Mr. Mike Brown, Brian and Bennett, both local trainers, Virgil uh, Literal, who's a, a, a CT, a DT instructor, sorry, uh, with TPD. These, these guys are way better than I am at any of this stuff, and I've spent a lot of time with them training and learning what they have to say. So... My point is, if you're like, man, this is interesting stuff, I want to learn more, get your challenge coin. Try it for whatever we offer, three weeks free or 14 days free, and uh, see if you like it. So, all right, without any more delay, uh, I've got a couple things I want to show you today that are the show sponsor. Today's show sponsor specifically is, number one, the Cool Fire Trainer, and I also want to show you this for a safety perspective. So if you're jumping on and you haven't seen me before, you're going to see me fire some rounds here in a second with a cool fire converted Wilson Combat Beretta. So if you look at the barrel, you can see a little cool fire marking on top of the barrel. This barrel is a replacement barrel and the recoil spring is a replacement recoil spring for my Beretta, which allows me to pull the trigger. Holy moly, and I just shot a hole in my ceiling. Just kidding. The cool fire trainer is so unique because it has a striker system in the barrel. And when you pull the trigger, the fire pin hits the striker and the striker actually cycles the slide because the barrel is filled with compressed CO2. So if I'm working on multiple, shot drills, I can use the Cool Fire Trainer. It's like dry fire on steroids. So that's sponsor number one, the Cool Fire Trainer. You can check them out at coolfiretrainer.com. Of course, the link is in the show notes as well. If not, we'll throw the link up there. The second sponsor for today's show is, let me float this across. Some music. That is my signature series. Rich, do you have a signature series holster yet from John? Please send me one of these. Negative. Man, John Marcus, if you see this and you're watching this or anybody from Precision sees this, someone message him on Facebook and tell him, shame on him, that he doesn't send Mr. Rich Brown a, a signature line. This is a C-Clander signature line. There's a competition line called the Fast. This one is the Ultra Appendix Inside the Waistband Holster. It has some design features if you're an appendix carrier um, that are very specific to you. He also has the uh, Ultra Inside the Waistband Holster if you're not an appendix carrier. I think he makes that in the signature line as well. Anyways, the signature line is the one with the stars and stripes on it. So the subdued Kydex pattern has stars and stripes. Of course, precisionholsters.com. If you're looking for a good holster, check them out. Okay? Okay. Where am I going to go from here? Oh, I know. We are talking about distance consideration. So, folks, um, if you're jumping on, do me a favor, by the way. Do me a huge favor. Click the share button. I don't know how many live folks we have on right now. Last week, we hit like 88, and I'm really, really trying to hit 100. That's my goal is to get us back to the old school numbers of 100 and then maybe climb from there. And we you are at, we are fighting a battle here, right, against the Facebook and the algorithms where they're promoting something other than us oftentimes, but at least they're allowing us to be on here. So, Mark Zuckerberg, thank you so much. I appreciate you. If you ever want a shooting lesson, reach out to me. I'm, I'm here for you. Rich Brown. Is here for you, Mr. Mark. Um, anyways, do me a favor, click the share button. For those of you that haven't shared it in our, our training group, say something, hey, compelling, like we're talking about close quarter shooting positions, which everyone on Instagram thinks they know a lot about, but I don't see a lot of them banging it out on Instagram and figuring it out by actually pressure testing this stuff, which is what we've done and what you have to do if you want to actually figure out if it, if it truly works, okay? So uh, click the share button, and we're going to get right into this. Rich, um, man, how many people we have on right now? 
on. We have 44 on, and Tony wants to know, does the PH and FAST stand for Phil no. Strader? No, the, the PH, PH does not stand for Phil. Uh, matter of fact, is Phil on this morning? Sorry, I Phil. I haven't seen him yet. Hopefully we don't see Phil Strader this morning because none of us want to see Phil Strader stirring up the pot because he's nothing but a pain in the butt. No, uh, Precision Holsters asked, Tony, I, know, I think you already knew that answer, but thank you for asking and, and bringing up Mr. Phil Strader's name. So, all right, so let's get into the uh, let's get into the actual show itself. So, by the way, uh, if you're wondering and you're watching this, how do you practice this stuff? Well, uh, I'm actually utilizing a bob. I have it set up on a table. The bob is normally set up on a base. It's a big, round, heavy base. You can fill it with water or sand. I don't have my base in here because a lot of my striking I do in the combatives room or my gym or my garage, and the base is big and heavy to move, and I actually couldn't move it in time to get it in the live stream. So I have it set up on a table. Well, I won't be striking Bob real hard today, but I have a couple of dumbbells set around and hopefully leveraged up with Susie and his hand. So if you have a bob, a bob is a great way to work this stuff because bob offers a 3D-type target system. So I could be striking to the chest or striking to specific target areas. I'm also visually and mentally getting the stimulus of a real person that, uh, or what looks like a real person with the face and eyes or whatever else. And I think that does something to your brain versus striking on a, on a heavy bag, for example. The other thing you're going to need is a good old-fashioned blue gun. It's probably the simplest and cheapest. If you don't have a blue gun that mimics your live firearm, Get on Amazon today and order a blue or red gun that mimics your live firearm because that way you could practice a lot of these techniques with the training partner. Another idea is obviously a cert trainer. This is called a shot ind indicating resetting trigger. This is a demonstration tool. Um, it actually has a little laser and uh, indicator in the front. So when I pull the trigger on this one, you might be able to see the laser on Bob. So we're, gonna, we're talking about this. I'll use this primarily. And probably one of the best is to take your actual firearm and convert it with a cool fire trigger. So when you're practicing these drills, you can actually practice firing from the positions, right? Rotating off and firing from the close quarter position. And this is going to tell you, hey, am I dragging the slide on my body and doing all these different things, okay? So let's talk about distance considerations in terms of um, the material today. When we're shooting, if you have to defend yourself, and by the way, let's see, I, I see a couple people on that I know. I see, ooh, Kim's on, I've seen Kim before. Vicky, good morning, how are you? Eric, nice to see you again. And uh, you guys should collaborate and create an AWS line of holsters. We kind of do, Eric. We have an AWS line. Technically, the signature line is the AWS line of holsters. Um, although Rich Brown doesn't have one. I started to say, so I do have a line of holsters. It's pretty, pretty funny, actually, that Rich Brown doesn't have one. Maybe you don't deserve one, man. Maybe you should go back to the range. Sorry, didn't mean to say that out loud. Old school. Willie is on. Nice. Will Parker, Montana. Man, we got a bunch of people. That's awesome. I love that. How many people on right now, Rich? We had 53 a minute ago. We're currently 51. Oh, does that mean two people didn't like us? That's right. They don't like you. Hey, come on. Click the share button. Put it in a bunch of groups. Everybody, every 51 of you right now, click share, 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 share. Go ahead. I'll take a second. I won't start. I'll give you a couple minutes before I start. Because here in a second, I'm going to show you the extended position. I'm going to show you the close quarter position. And I'm going to show you how to get to the extreme close quarter position where you're literally contacting your body with your hand or the gun itself and what you might want to do with the other hand. So do me a favor. Before I start, click share. I know the live stream stops for just a moment oftentimes when you hit share. I know Richard's probably sharing as well, but please share it because I want to I want to get up to 80 or 90. I want to see if we can get up to 80 or 90, okay? And I see a bunch of you shared already, okay? All right, if you're sharing it while we're taking this extra moment in time, grab your blue gun, your, uh, your shirt pistol, or your cool fire trainer. Grab whatever you want, and we're going to start this, this deal, okay? So, um, by the way, um, before I begin, the cool fire, just if you're wondering how it works, if you haven't seen it, to fill up the barrel with CO2, all I do is uh, insert my tip of my barrel on this canister, right? Upside down, by the way. And as you hear that kind of that gas sound, that's it filling the barrel with CO2. Uh, this is a standard... Tipman paintball kind of airsoft canister, right? And then I could pull the trigger and I get that recoil. Okay, so there you go. All right, let's so let's talk about distance. So you're going to have to use your imagination to an extent because I can't I can't have Bob quite far enough away and you still see him on the camera as I was need to. And there are three positions I want to talk to you about today: the extended position. So if you maybe uh, let's 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 go ahead and uh, put this in context. 
you're in your home, you got your 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 home defense handgun locked up in a quick access safe. You you hear that bump in the night, right? And you decide you're going to go out and search. Now there are a couple things uh, right away that are wrong about that. If you hear that bump in the night and you don't need to search, meaning you could call the police, go to a safe area where you could barricade yourself, that's a much better option. So in context, and by the way, as people jump on this live stream, they're like, well, why is he telling us to search or do these things? Please make sure you're answering those questions for me. So the point is, don't search if you don't have to. But let's say we have to because you have kids in the house, right? Uh, we, we, I, I, I'm not going to let my kids be in danger while I'm hiding in my bedroom with my home defense handgun. Right. So we decide that we're going to be moving around the house. Now, the first principle of, of weapon retention is to retain your gun. Keep it as close to your body as possible. So if you watch me shoot on the range, for those of you that watch me shoot, I know most of you probably have, you would see me extend the handgun and fire a shot. Right. Uh, when I'm moving through my house, I'm going to be moving through the house in a couple different positions. So most of my movement will be done from what I call the high ready position where the gun is compressed to my body but I formed a full grip around it. If you notice the gun is slightly canted to the left, that's because I can't have a full grip with the gun straight up and down. This hurts my wrist and it breaks my grip apart. So when I'm doing this, I just pull the gun close to my body and I may search like this. So my head and eyes are up and open and my gun is not in front of my vision, but it's near my face. So I'm not occluding my vision, right? The second thing you might see me do is if I came through a very close doorway, I may rotate the hand and bring the other hand up near my head. So uh, the, the, the main reason for this is if I come through that doorway and there is someone on the other side of the doorway, and let's say they've grabbed that broom handle or axe handle or stick or whatever else, or they got something, and when I come through that doorway, they're hiding and they're waiting for me. I want to have a hand that's up and ready to receive some sort of impact to protect my head, and that's what that hand, hand is doing. So I may transition from this search position to a position where I'm coming through a doorway and defending my head. Once again, if you notice though, my hand is in a position where I could cage up or defend my head, but it's not in a position where I'm occluding my vision. So there's some basic principles for you. But in terms of distance considerations, one of the things that I've seen probably 100% of the time with students that are not well trained in combative circumstances where we're doing simulation events is we have a role player, he's got a helmet on, he's dressed up with padding or whatever else. Uh, the student gets in a position where they're forced to draw because it's, you know, we give them stimulus, hey, you're gonna draw a handgun, you're gonna defend yourself. And at this distance, they do this, right? Now, Bob doesn't have arms. By the way, I should introduce my training partner. This is Bob. Bob stands for Body Opponent Bag by Century Martial Arts. But the point is, you can imagine if Bob has arms, if I were to point the gun at Bob at this distance, what Bob could do. Bob could very easily reach up and grab my handgun. So rule number one is to understand the distance where you should be extending the handgun and compressing the handgun. So oftentimes what I'll do is, and I'll try to stay on camera, is I'll put my students at a distance where they can extend their safe training tool, like a blue gun or whatever else, and then I'll have them walk toward their partner and I'll have them tell me where they think they're no longer safe to extend the handgun. And intuitively, intuitively, we all pretty much realize that that distance is a distance where a human could reach their arm out, take a step, you know, and grab your firearm. And you all already know that distance. If you've, you know, you've been alive for more than 20 years, 10 years, you know that distance because we deal with distances in our 3D environment all the time. So the first one is, all right, figure out, okay, I'm okay to extend the handgun at this distance, maybe because he can't reach me, but I need to start compressing it as I get closer. So if you notice, there's a point. Maybe for me, you know, I'm faking this because I'm on camera. Maybe the point is actually back here, probably, right? That's a position where Bob can't reach me. So if my gun can be extended here, if I get any closer, what I have to do is I have to bring the gun closer to my body. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the gun from an extended position and I'm compressing it right back to my chest. We used to call this the high ready in the air marshal service. By the way, I used to be the, the lead instructor for the FAMS, and we did a bunch of close quarter stuff because we were always in an airplane uh, cabin with 200 or 300 passengers. So understanding different firearm positions was really critical for our mission. Once again, from the side, I'm going to take my handgun, right, and I'm going to slowly compress the handgun right back to my body to the point where my arms typically touch my chest. Now, uh, in this position, notice that my gun is not 
down near my belly, right? This would not be a, a high ready. This would be a low ready. It's still in my periphery. It's still nice and high. So I can see with my vision as I'm looking at the threat where the muzzle's pointing. I could turn my body and I could fire shots and get hits all day long. Matter of fact, in this position, if I take the handgun, right, I know exactly where the gun's pointing, right? I can, you know, I can set up targets and I typically demo this with students seven or eight or nine yards away and I can hit a target seven or eight or nine yards away, right, using this technique or this position. Now, I would not need to compress and shoot from seven or eight or nine yards away. It's just a point of if you understand the indexing of the firearm in your body, how you can pull that off and get those hits. By the way, uh, if you're just joining us, good morning. My name is Mike C. Cleaner. I'm prompted by my friend and co-host, Mr. Rich Brown. I don't know how many live viewers we have on, 50, 60. We hit 60, man, or did anybody get it? 55 on? currently. 55. I'll take 55. Five, 55 is a good number. By the way, if you haven't liked or shared, please do that. Jump it on right now. We're talking about distance considerations. And if you have questions here in a second, feel free to start throwing those questions up, and we'll talk about that. So we talked about distance consideration number one, where we need to go from an extended position to a compressed position that I call the high ready and how to build that position, right? Notice the muzzle is horizontal to the ground, and you're probably wondering, well, Mike, how do you how do you aim this? How do we verify alignment? Verification of alignment with a handgun is always um, visually uh, a difficult thing if you are in a close quarter position because visually now I can't reference the sights necessarily, but I can see. You can take your finger or your unloaded firearm if you have one. You can see in your periphery exactly where it's pointed. But when I get to my high ready position, I use my body to index the gun. I don't do a lot of orienting the gun with my wrists. So I'm using my body to aim the gun, right? I can get hits all day long because I understand exactly where the gun is in relationship to my body, okay? So that's uh, principle number one. Now, once I get to this distance, I may be compressed and at a point where, you know, my opponent can no longer grab the handgun. But what if the distance is closing very, very quickly? Like this person may be running at me. One of the things that... that this technique or these techniques will allow you to do is very quickly react to someone who's closing the distance and that it does not respect your firearm. And if you're watching the news or have watched the news in the last two years, we have seen situation after situation of riots and massive events and things that may require you to understand and react to the distance of the humans around you that may be trying to grab your gun, or maybe not even trying to grab your gun, just trying to punch you in the face, uh, where if you leave the gun out there, now the gun becomes a, a potential weapon they could take away and use against you, okay? So once I've got to this position and I've learned how to do this, okay, I need to understand that if I get even closer, now I'm still within Bob's hand and arm range. So what do I do here? Here I'm gonna transition to a secondary close quarter position. And I'm going to show you this in a different angle here in a second. I'm going to rotate off of the gun, right? And I'm going to start to retract the gun. And I'm going to pull the gun back as far as I possibly can. As much as my shoulder and arm flexibility will allow, right? This other arm is typically to go out there. And I, I can use it for a lot of different things. I'm going to show you some kind of some pros and cons. But oftentimes, what I'll actually do is stiff arm to the chest or the upper chest area. Now... If you look at my hands and my gun position, you're probably noticing a couple things, right? Number one, if you can see the laser dot on the target, my muzzle is at a downward angle, right? The reason my muzzle is at a downward angle is if I've rotated to the shoot position, let's say you're the threat, right? So I've extended my handgun, you got too close, I've compressed my handgun, you get even closer, I'm rotating straight off the muzzle, and now I'm either maybe putting my fingers in your eyes or using my hand as stiff arm, and I'll talk about the stiff arm here in a second. Notice that my hand is technically in front of the muzzle, right? And I know we may say, well, uh, when I say that, I should say it's forward of the muzzle, but not in front of the muzzle. Maybe that's a better term, right? Um, so here's the deal. If my hand is in this position to be striking, or stiff arming, or defending, or parrying, or wrapping, or doing all of these different things, my gun has to be in a position where I can use it. So I see a lot of folks doing the old school uh, rock and lock. And when I was in the police academy, Rich, I don't know if they taught you guys that, they taught the rock and lock, where they oh, yeah. draw the handgun, rock it out of the holster, lock it into position, right, and then fire from close range. And I, 
I, I think that's a viable position for some circumstances, but for uh, what my buddy Virgil calls the foot, the fouled up tangle, where you're starting to be engaged with the person at contact distance, I don't like this position because if you look at this position, now my muzzle and my hand are in the same space. I don't ever want to do that. I want to be in a position where when I retract the handgun and rotate the hand off the handgun, it's stiff arm, you know, or, or strike bob or whatever else. Now I can truly fire as I'm doing these things, right? So when you're practicing these things, which is why Bob is such an invaluable training tool. I can't tell you how often I do this where I go out and I work a series of strikes and then I work rotating off the gun and throwing my strike or doing my stiff arm to the chest and I fire shots and I can immediately see with my cert trainer or with my cool fire trainer with my laser indicator on the center because you can take a laser indicator and screw it on the tip of the cool fire barrel. So as I'm, I'm building my positions and stiff arming, I can see right away exactly where those shots are going, if that makes sense. Now, let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about the stiff arm versus the head strikes real quick. And then after that, I'll pause and I'll entertain some questions. I know, uh, I know that um, Rich probably has some questions for me. So why would, I, why would I stiff arm the chest, right, versus automatically strike to the face? You know, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not proposing that either is necessarily better, but here's what we've kind of found or what I believe. The face is a great target if I can get to it right? The problem with the face is it's greasy and oftentimes sweaty. So if I'm, if I'm trying to keep this person back from me, right, while I'm firing shots and hoping they have effect, or maybe not firing shots, and we'll talk about why I would not fire shots in a second. I think it's a critical point. Um, the hand itself during the striking can slide off the head. So if I slide off the head with that open palm type strike, now the person is within my arm's distance. I don't want that to happen. So if possible, if I'm doing this, I may be popping, popping to the face. What I found oftentimes, though, is, is stiff arm, arming to the chest. And I'll credit the guys at, at TPD. They had a guy that uh, was in their combatives class that was using a standard. For those of you that played football, I think it came from football, you know, we used to come up to a block position and pop, pop, you know, stiff arm, pop, pop. And that, that, that energy of that motion would oftentimes, you know, keep someone back longer than just hitting them one time. So that stiff arm position is once you get a rotation off the gun, we're pop, pop, I'm, I'm literally popping you. If I could demonstrate this to a human, you would understand how effective it is. Matter of fact, I think I have some alumni on right now. It's incredibly effective if you're pulling the gun back as far as you possibly can, right? Which is super important. And you're continually stiff arming. And more importantly, I have a good posture, right? So my posture is square to the target and it's strong, okay? Um, here in a second, I'm going to talk to you about the details of rotating off the gun so you're safe and transitioning from one position to the other position. But Mr. Rich Brown, what do I have as far as questions? All right. We got Greg. He says, if the threat is coming at you quickly and you have felt threatened enough to draw your weapon, why not just pull the trigger versus pulling it back? Boom. Great question, Greg. And I knew I would get that question. I love that question. And here's why. You... When you have, um, when you're in a situation where you've, you're pulled your handgun for self-defense or you're searching your house already. So self-defense is already warranted, meaning you have the, the, the reason to believe you need to defend yourself with a handgun. The problem with that is you may be in a circumstance where you don't have the ability to shoot right away. So let's say I pulled my gun out. Uh, strange dude in the parking lot. This is a strange guy in the parking lot. I was at distance initially, you know, pointing the gun. He compresses the distance, and as he's compressing the distance, things are going on. But guess what? I happen to be with my two daughters. Now, they're cowering kind of behind me or to my side. And the second they see this wild man running at me with a knife or whatever else, they kind of disappear. So now I'm in a circumstance where this guy is coming, and in, in an instant, he's on top of me, right? And I'm going, okay, I know, I know Mia is over here somewhere. I saw her move in the corner of my eye, but I don't know where she went. It's dark. She may very well be right there, right behind the guy, right? So I don't have the ability to shoot until I know for a fact, okay, my family member's clear or whatever else. The second thing is it may happen so fast that you can't pull the trigger. Like this person at just a few yards away, five or six yards away, 
could be on, on top of me before I've made the decision to shoot. And the last one is some of you may choose not to shoot for a moment of time. So let's say you're searching your house, you see movement out of the corner of your eye, and the next thing you know, that person is closing the distance, right? But you can't identify the person. You don't know what the circumstance is. Now, I know a lot of you say, well, Mike, if he's in my home, he's getting shot. Okay. Let's play that out for a second. Well, let's say, what if this is your stupid teenager or the neighborhood kid, or maybe the, you know, the, the, the individual in the neighborhood that has some mental problems that for whatever reason got confused and got into your house. Uh, I myself have had some stupid teenager encounters. And in, in that case, I may choose not to shoot. I'll give you another great example. I had a buddy in law enforcement that was in a situation where he was in a house and he, he, he was uh, facing a, an 80 year old crazy woman, old granny, crazier than crap, big, huge, you know, probably 200 plus pound uh, female. And she charged him in this hallway, right? And he, he chose, you know, to, boom, to stiff arm her and to, and to get back and to get out of this situation or to, to create distance and took her to the ground and she ended up, you know, being a wrestler or whatever else. That old lady didn't need to be shot at that moment in time. So I'm giving you some tools that will, will allow you to defend your handgun and not shoot someone right away or not shoot the handgun until it's appropriate. Now, and also in answer to your question, Greg, if, if you if you are warranted and and there's you choose to shoot because you have a safe backstop and you're not worried about your family members and you've identified this is a threat, absolutely pull the trigger, pull the trigger. Right, pull the trigger, right, and we'll talk about the transition from shooting. So that's that's the reason we may not want to shoot in some circumstances, and we have to have tools for everything. All right, Mike Alan Kelly says if you shoot from bad breath distance and have to strike, should you generally start increasing distance away from the threat? So if you shoot from bad breath and you have to strike, okay. So so here's so let, let's break this whole flow down, right? So if I could, I would shoot from here. I'm warranted. I'm justified. I'm pulling through, right? It doesn't work. He gets too close. I may transition as I'm shooting to this position. It doesn't work. There's a, a momentary pause here where I'm not an advocate of continuing to shoot as you build the next position. There may be a pause where I'm firing. Now I'm pausing, right? And now I'm stiff arming because the, the goal here is to keep the person off me or back, right? So I'm stiff arming, but there's still a lethal threat. Once I stiff arm and build the position, I verify my hands are clear or whatever else, I'm still firing the gun, right? I'm hoping this guy is down by then. There's a possibility we may end up closer where now from the stiff arm is not working, they've collapsed the distance. I do not want them inside my arms. This is a critical factor and I do not want them behind my arm, right? So what I may do is I may collapse to the point where I'm actually covering my head up. So now I'm utilizing my elbow to create distance. I also have half of my head covered up so if this guy is swinging at my head, and I know the other arm could potentially uh, potentially punch me in the face. I get that. But now I've collapsed to this distance, and I'm continuing to fight. Now, right? So from here, what do I have? And by the way, I should have said this in the beginning. In all of these ranges, you have all of your tools, right? So you, you, you have the striking tools, the hands, the elbows, all the things that you may know how to do, you have. So, for example, you know, at, at this distance, right, I may, I may be throwing a kick. I'm, I may be throwing a punch kick, which I do. I practice on Bob all the time. I practice bringing the gun back to a high ready and then kicking, but having the muzzle. I can't kick Bob because he's on the table right now. But having the muzzle in a position, notice a little bit higher, where it's not going to shoot me in the foot. Okay. So, uh, to answer to Alan, Alan's question, once I get to here, I'm always trying to either shoot, right? or continue to move my body to increase the distance where I can get the gun back into a two-handed shooting position and I can get to a safer place. Because I don't want to be close. You don't want to, at close range, be in the foot, the fouled up tangle, right? You're too close. There's too many things going on. I promise, I promise you this person, well-trained or not well-trained, and they probably won't be well-trained. They're just going to be big, strong, crazy criminal, whatever, right? They're not going to see this gun and say, I'm just going to ignore that gun. They're going to be going for your gun. This becomes the most important thing in the fight at that moment. Now, Rich just showed for a second ago, he showed a flashlight. Could we be using a flashlight striking? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? Can, 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 I, can I use these positions right here to strike? You know? Notice how Bob's going to have a hard time seeing that. If he can't see, guess what he can't do? He can't fight. My old instructor, Tommy Mossman, used to say, if they can't see, they can't fight. 
If they can't breathe, they can't fight. If they can't stand, they can't fight. So think about that for a second. Rich, did I answer that question okay? You did, sir. Joey Sorry. says, Joey says, trigger discipline is important when using your weak hand to do anything, strike, push, grab, open a door, anything. Sympathetic hand movement is a real thing. I couldn't agree more, man. I mean, we've, we've literally seen it proven over, over, again, over and over again in law enforcement. Matter of fact, I used to have a beat partner that had a sympathetic uh, discharge and killed a person because of it. He actually got out of the, uh, was not charged, but had a sympathetic dis discharge. Um, Gas and Glock came and testified in that particular trial. That's from what I've been told, by the way. So, in terms of Joe, what Joey's talking about, like you know, if I'm if I'm transitioning from here and I'm shooting, I need to stop shooting for a second. Where I'm stiff, stiff arming, striking, building a better position, defending my head, or whatever else. Okay. Uh, one more thing. Let me show you this in detail. Then I'll answer some more questions. When I am uh, rotating off this, notice how I'm rotating up the side of the gun. Okay, I never come in front of the muzzle, boom, and I throw my strike. To get my hand back on the handgun, if I had appropriate distance, I'd bring it back to my chest and bring it under the handgun, right? So once again, hand comes off of the handgun, boom, right? Back to the chest, back to the handgun. Okay, so that's my transition. Bad or more. Gerald Maniac. Gerald noticed my name, by the way. All right, Mike, got another question for you, pal. Yeah. Steve wants to know, is that shot placement in the hip groin area more effective than a straight shot that might go through the gut without hitting a bone? Yeah, so great question, Steve. So it, his, Steve's question is, if, if I'm targeting this low position, right? So let's say I have stiff, stiff, arm, stiff armed or struck. These shots, right, I am purposely indexing and aiming and practicing to go right through the top of the pelvis, and um, you know the, the way the pelvis girdle is is set up, it's like kind of like this. You know, with the pelvis is open, the spine attaches down the backside. You know, there's the femorals, there's my groin. You know, all this stuff that's pretty vital is right there. So this this shot should be at a lower pelvis distance, which is the perfect thing if you talk about targeting. That's why I tell you, folks, I know. They're one of our show sponsors for the American Warrior Show, but this is my single favorite training tool in terms of combatives because I could target eyes, I could target groin, and I know for a fact, like for example, Bob's hip bones would be right there. On one of my other Bob's, I actually have the hip bones. I stood next to Bob and said, okay, there's my hip bone, and I drew it, right? Then I could kind of envision exactly where the pelvic girdle is. So I practice where the, no, notice the dot there. That's too high. I don't want that. Although that would probably go through and hit the spine. And anytime I theoretically get a bunch of damage on that spine or whatever else, that's good. So I want to be down in the hip area, center mass as much as possible. Um, hopefully I'm going to do some damage to the spine. But I think that in this situation, when you're putting five or six shots down on the pelvis, groin, center spine area, I'm hoping that it has some sort of effect on the threat, right? Where at least they can't fight as effectively and you could throw a strike and they fall down. And then we could, once again, we go from that position where we get our distance and now we can aim and use more accuracy and headshots or whatever else. Okay. So good question. Our good friend, Mr. Bob Beal is on and he wants to know how important is it to stay squared to the target versus blading yourself when striking distance? Yeah, that's another great question. If you didn't hear Bob's question, if we're blading off, the problem with blading off is, and a lot of you were probably taught to blade and probably think that blading off is the right thing to do. The problem with blading off is when I start to blade off more and more and more to protect the gun, now I've, I've presented a six circumstance or situation where this person can get past my arm and potentially get to my back. Right. Can, you can imagine someone parrying your arm or maybe just in the fouled up tangle as they start to tackle me. Now they grab me around the waist or the back. So remember these rules. I really don't want anybody inside my arm. And I definitely, definitely don't want someone outside my arm. And by blading off, there's a very good chance I'm going to get outside. So what I'm doing here, give you a better visual, I'm, I'm keeping my... My pelvis square as I'm striking and moving around Bob, right? So if this is my threat, I'm keeping my pelvis square the entire time. You may find you're going to have a tendency to start to turn. 
square back up because you'll be you'll be much stronger in terms of your frame or position for elbowing, throwing strikes, countering, doing all these other things. You know, um, you know, watch the top MMA fighters, fighter wrestlers. You know, they're they're always in position where they're, they're square up. They're rarely ever fighting like this. They don't do this kind of stuff because people that are truly at close range can get past the arm and get onto the back. So great question, Bob. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, one of the things you talk about in class, Mike, is if, if, if someone said, hey, push that car out of the way in an intersection, would you blade your body first? That's right. You, you would square your hips right up and, and push on that target itself. Cool. All right, man. What else do we have, Rich? Any other questions on the positions? No, sir. Okay, so a uh, couple things. I want you to, here's what I want you to consider doing. Number one, get yourself a training tool. Blue gun, cheapest, uh, cert type trainer. Great, because it has the laser as well. Uh, probably the best because you can convert your handgun and you can use a laser. Cool fire trainer, check them out, okay? So get a training tool. And then I want you to work at appropriate distances um, if you have a, a, a training partner. And all I want you to do is start at a distance of about seven or eight yards, okay? Um, have them slowly approach you. I want you to lock yourself into position, and I want you to extend the handgun. And as they get closer, okay, you could be giving verbal commands if you want. Hey, stop, get back, okay? If you're uh, in context, you're applying the knowledge that you have the ability to shoot and desire to shoot, feel free to pull the trigger to train yourself that stimulus response. Hey, stop back, get, get back, get back, boom, 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 okay? Then have your partner slowly start to encroach. Once they get to a distance where it's no longer appropriate to extend the handgun, compress the handgun. Hey, stop, get back. If you want to pull the trigger from here, that's fine, okay? Then they're going to get even closer. Once they get to uh, the distance where it's too close to be in the high ready position, I want you to rotate your hand off the gun, and I want you to stiff arm the, the person's chest. I want you to rotate the gun straight back, and I want you to pull the trigger as well. If you have a cool fire trainer or a cert pistol, because you're going to have that laser, you're going to see exactly where those shots are going, right? Should be center of the pelvis, not lower abdomen, although none of those are bad shots. But if I can put some damage and be splintering off the pelvis and hitting the spine at the same time, that's probably the best area for me to be in. Think about the downward angle, okay? Okay, so once you've done that, you're going to stiff arm, and if you want to fire a couple shots, then they're going to stop. Your training partner's not going to hit you or anything like that, and then they're going to start backing up. And once they get to an appropriate distance, you're going to bring the hand to your chest, go back to your high ready. When they get a little farther away, then you can extend the handgun. So I want you to rotate through that, back and forth, back and forth. You do it, they do it. By the way, no live firearms. No, like, hey, guys, let's practice this with our unloaded guns. No. You cannot use a gun that could be fired for this drill, okay? So, so don't, don't forget that safety note. Cool fire trainer is fine if you've identified I have a cool fire trainer because a cool fire trainer cannot be loaded. A bullet cannot get in that chamber, okay? That's why it's a perfect training tool, okay? So there's, there's a thought for you. Doesn't take any ammo, can do it at home or in your yard or your garage, and then you go back and forth. And then you could add things. And by the way, this is, like I said, this is 5%. If you're a coin member, log in and learn the cage position. Rotate from shooting the stiff arm to the cage position. You know, let someone throw a couple strikes. So I may go from the stiff arm or I'm shooting a couple shots to close. Boom, so I'm caging up, right? Then throw a strike off. Boom. Get the hand back on the handgun. Extend the handgun, right? Boom, boom. Stiff arm. Close range, right? So you can work all those. Now, when you go to the range, I would like you to try some live fire drills, a couple safety notes for you. When you're shooting at a downward angle, make absolutely certain you have a safe backstop, no rocks, no metal. You're not going to hit the target frame. Once again, all safety rules apply. And I want you to uh, get about two yards from the target. I want you to extend your handgun. I want you to build your high ready position. Look down, make sure the slide is not going to hit you in the chest, and then fire a shot. Boom. See where the bullet goes. And then learn to adjust your high ready left or right or up or down. Uh, and don't forget, don't lean back. Don't be back on your heels and fire those shots. The second thing, if you have the ability, and by the way, I would not do this live fire if you don't have an instructor or have, have had some training. But those of you that have an instructor or have had some training, then you could, after practicing this position, live fire, then you could practice rotating off the gun, right? 
protecting your head, getting into this position, and firing. Now, one detail about this that I didn't say. When I'm in this position, the thumb, see the thumb? In between the frame of the handgun and my body allows the slide to cycle. If I push the slide into my body and touch my body, I will have a malfunction, right? So make sure your thumb is in that position, okay? I do not, however, do this or this. This is all the crap you're going to see on the internet. Trust me, if you're fighting a real person and they're trying to get your gun, you could play this out if you want. Try it. Trust me. Uh, this is way easier to grab than this is. When I push the gun up against my body, it's very difficult for someone to get their hand on, a, and, and on the handgun and get a good get a good grip on it, okay? Oh, man. Um, Mr. Rich, how are we doing? How many people we got? We still got a few people on. We got 57 folks on, Mike. 57 people interested in learning these positions, all right? We talked about three specific positions. I don't have a lot more time, but let's do a little Q&A, and then I'll summarize this in proper instructor form. Rich, do we have any other questions or comments I need to know about? Yeah, there's a couple of questions here, and some of them may be difficult to, to kind of get into. Eric has a question. says, what technique would you recommend as, as a recovery technique? For an instance, someone does get behind you while your gun is out. Worst case oh, scenario. Yeah, that's a really great question. All right, so. So many variables in that one. There's a, yeah, there's a, there, there's no definitive answer for that or any of this stuff. There's no black and white answer. But I, I, I will tell you, um, I saw a, a video a long time ago. I'll, I'll give some credit, even though I, I think a lot of people think he's hokey. It was actually, I think, Instructor Zero, this that little Italian dude that's like four foot tall. Instructor Zero, if you're hearing this, you're I'm sure you're a badass, so love you. Um, anyways, you know, I think it was him. He, he was shooting, pop, pop, he would shoot a shot, and then he would, he would scan. He would do this kind of stuff with his elbows. And so here's, here's what I work on on Bob. So on the Bob... I'll set up Bob and I'll work on boom, elbow strikes, right? Right? From a from a from a two-handed position, right? Right. So I'm working all my elbow strikes here. So some, if someone gets behind me, I have a handgun out. I'm using all of my lower body positioning, right? All of my footwork and power, and all of the strikes I can to mitigate the fact that they're behind me. Okay. Now, the problem is if they're behind me and they're wrapping up. Once again, the single most important thing I have to protect is the gun. So if I can get two hands on the handgun, you'd be amazed at how powerful these strikes are, even if you're super close. So if he's wrapped up and I'm going wham with both arms, wham, right, wham, wham. And this is something, once again, I practice with Bob. So once again, I've transitioned from this. Now there's someone behind me. I've rotated down. Now I'm grabbing my handgun, right, okay, because I can't shoot it right now. Then I'm using both of my arms and my whole body as sledgehammers and elbow, and I'm trying to generate power from my body. If I can get boom and get, get some distance, I can rotate right back to my shooting position or my close quarter position. Because I think it was Eric that asked that question. Well, that's a really bad position. You do not want someone to get on your back um, and grab the handgun. But and just is rich. Get, folks, get your challenge going. Go in the combative section on the AWS website, in the vault. I'm going to teach you how to deal with this, someone grabbing a hand on your handgun. I'm going to show you the weapon strip. I'm going to show you all the, the weapon retention techniques in those that video series. This is just, like I said, a, a very small introduction to the, the, the material itself. Okay? I think the key word to a lot of this, Mike, may be context and distance specific. I mean, if, if you're under, because a moment ago you told them to practice with a training partner, with an inert training device like a blue gun or a cert, uh, but you gave them a specific yard line like the seven or eight or nine yard line. And I think that's important because anything closer, they may not be, need to be drawing that handgun, right? Oh, uh, so, well, yeah, in terms of context specific, understand that the way I set this up, if you're just joining me at the tail end of this, I said, there's been a bump in the night. You've grabbed your home defense handgun and you're moving through the house or whatever else. Maybe the same thing applies in a mall or a parking lot. The gun's already out. Understand that if I'm closer than seven or eight yards to the opponent and I'm still holstered, uh, I, I'm not a big advocate of a close quarter drawing technique that's at speed that's going to be functional until I've got Bob in a position, my opponent in a position where I have some sort of control. Right. We call that the, the 
the drag drive draw process. You know, it's the ECQC, Craig Douglas and all these guys developed this, you know, they're, that's the material that's inside the vault. We've taken you know, small chunks of it that you can apply and train real quickly. So please, if you're watching, I'm not advocating we draw at closer range. If they're that close, we probably need to deal with combatants, right? Part of the solution first before grabbing the handgun out of the holster. Because the second the handgun that comes out of the holster, guess what? Now you have one hand tied up, okay? And only one hand to defend your head in a circumstance where you can't immediately find a good shooting position. Um, so that's really but I don't cool. understand, Mike. On the Instagram, I see all these sub-second ninjas. Yeah, because they're sub-second. Ah. Boom. Do it again. Let me do it again, Rich. Yeah, please. It's fast, right? And they're shooting at like contact distance. I don't I don't know. Yeah, that's a problem. Maybe I'm going to start posting some stuff on Instagram, some true shooting challenge tests. And I'm, I'm, I want all the Instagram shooters to follow along. There's some top level shooters that will be able to do the things that I can do. But then hey, let's do this. Let's let's put people in the followed up tangle and see what actually happens to these fast appendix carry draw processes where we're ripping and gripping with the other hand. And we don't realize that this hand might be tied up. Right. I might be using this other hand to tie it up or keep someone off me. So if I have to draw, guess which hand I have to sweep the garment with. Right. We talk about that a lot with our buddy uh, in Arizona. So. Yeah, Tony says, Mike, keep in mind that pulling a gun in a parking lot may be felony brandishing. Be sure you're well yeah. within the five elements of the law of self-defense. Amen. Uh, man, I see. A, what is that question from Billy? Billy says, does a blowback from firing that close to your body distract you or is it not noticeable? That's a, that's a good question. So let's address this for those of you that can safely do this live fire. So when you, when you work from the high rated position, you build the high rated position and you fire your gun for the first time, that... Uh, over pressure from the gun is going to be very close to your face, right? So be aware of that. It's not going to harm you at all. Even if the slide hits you because you have it too close to your body, it won't hurt you that much, right? We want to figure that position out there. So you are going to feel some over pressure. When I go, go to the, the closer, the extreme close quarter position and fire from here, you will feel the over pressure from the fire. You're going to feel the gas and whatever else. It is a little bit distracting, but not much. And if I'm in the right shooting position, I'm, I'm completely safe. I've locked the gun in. Once again, as a reminder, the thumb between the frame and the handgun is, is what builds that position, right? It's at a slight downward angle. And you can see I've literally pulled the handgun as far back as I can get. A lot of shooters end up like this. This is too easy to grab, too easy to defeat. I want the handgun as far back as I possibly can when I'm shooting. And for those of you that try this live fire, don't try this with the hand on your target. I do that in some classes that are very advanced. Try it with the hand back here. So what you might do is you might practice rotating, right? Striking the target, caging up, right? Three shots. Slide the gun down, your, or the hand down your body. Build your secondary position. Three shots. Get farther away. Three to the head. There's a little drill for you, okay? Safety, safety, safety. Yeah, Akeen says, don't draw if you're not going to fire your weapon. Akeen, you are exactly right. Good morning, Nick Higgins. I see you jumping on. All right, Mr. Rich Brown, any other questions that we need to address? Sir? No, sir. No, sir. All right, folks. Hey, so today, if you haven't watched us, if you're just jumping on, catching the tail end of this, we talked about distance considerations. If you own a handgun and you plan on using it for self-defense, you have to learn these distances and the shooting positions from those positions. I covered in detail the distance where an extended position might be appropriate. We talked about retracting the handgun to what I call the close quarter position. What distances this might be appropriate. And then rotating the hand safely off the handgun and not in front of the muzzle where we either do some sort of head type strike or what we define as a stiff arm to the upper chest of the person. And also how to fire and where we should be firing at in, um, in the lower body itself, the pelvic area. So we talked about the details there. I also taught the ability of getting the hand back on the handgun safely and efficiently without ever covering the muzzle, as well as rotating the hand into that close position and striking, once again, watch it, without ever covering my hand with the muzzle, boom, strike, and then why we're building these positions and how we're building them, okay? So, good question. If, you, if you're watching this, I would suggest this might be one you want to watch a second time, right? One minute tips on Instagram are awesome. On my Instagram page, those are very, very popular. But the details in this lesson will save your life. 
So if you're watching this now, go ahead and rewind it or download the video, okay? Um, if you're watching on YouTube, rewind it, shut the music off, get off Instagram, shut the TV off, go to a spot and watch it and learn from it because these things will truly save your life. I would bet, Rich, I don't know, man, 99% of the people out there are not prepared for the close range fight with a handgun like they should be. Get your challenge coin. Hey, the link's in there. If you're like, man, what is this thing they keep talking about? Just do it. Just get your challenge coin. Click the link. Trust me, when you get inside the vault, go to the combative area, go to the weapon retention area, watch the videos. If you don't love them and learn from them, cancel the membership. Send us an email, support at American Warrior Study. Cancel the membership. You won't be charged a dime. You get two weeks to watch all the videos if you want, okay? There's no downside to it. So great stuff. Uh, once again, uh, last but not least, don't forget today's show sponsor, the Cool Fire Trainer. Uh, the link is in the show notes as well. So if you're interested in a great training tool, Cool Fire Trainer. Secondly, check out Precision Holsters. My signature line is right on the homepage. We are going to get Mr. Rich Brown one of these. And last but not least, not the, the direct show sponsor, but don't forget about the Bob. If you're looking for a really good training tool, hey, buy yourself a Christmas present, right? Bob is probably the single best training tool I have, literally. Uh, for all my strikes, all my weapon strikes, all my close quarter stuff on Bob is a fantastic training tool. So. Mike, I've got a, I've got a couple of late questions come in if you want to entertain them. Let's do it, man. Let's okay, do it. one of them is uh, asking about where they can get the discount code for the Cool Fire Trainer. And the easiest thing to do, Derek, a uh, great question, is to go in the link today to the American Warrior Show, and you can get a discount code for Bob, which Mike has been using this morning, the Cool Fire Trainer, and all of our amazing sponsors. Yep, cool. Uh, uh, next question is, Walt wants to know, has the high pectoral position essentially replaced the shooting from the hip position? Yeah, good question, Walt. So I think Walt shooting from the hip is the drop, the rock and lock, and we covered that earlier in the video. This, this is um, – so the rock and lock, if, if I understand it correctly, came from a position where I'm close to a person, I'm on a traffic stop, someone pops me in the face, I'm, I'm knocked against my car and I'm getting the, the crap beat out of me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the gun out of the holster, lock it in the position and shoot from the hip, right? Hey, listen, I'm not – I'm not saying that technique is horrible or wrong in all cases, but I'm telling you at that point in time, if you have the ability, you're much better off defending your head, turning or throwing counter strikes, and then getting to a better position to draw the handgun. But to answer your question, well, yes, the, the high pectoral grip, I don't know if it's a replacement, but I think it's the proper extreme close quarter shooting position in most circumstances where um, you are too close to extend the handgun, where you're too close to have two hands on the handgun and you're trying to defend the handgun from a weapon grab where someone's trying to grab the gun and take it out of your hands. It's the position I think that is probably the most functional uh, to use. There's a couple of questions too, Mike, regarding uh, considerations for women. Like Don asked a question and someone else had a similar question. What about close hold positions for women? Anything specific for a woman? Yeah. So Don, I don't know what you're talking about as far as close hold. You'll have to show me a link or send a, that that detail to me and I'd be happy to look at it and analyze it. Um, here's the deal though. The techniques I've talking about are not, uh, um, are not, um, gender specific, gender specific. They're men, women, non-gender, non-binary men, women, binary, uh, whatever, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. They're the, they're principles, you know, extend. We're too close. Collapse. We're too close. We're going to go to this. Um, you know, I, I think for someone that might be uh, might lack strength, there's some folks that talk about you know grabbing the handgun and protecting the handgun with two hands. I'm not opposed to that if everything else has failed. Matter of fact, I, I demonstrated that on exactly how I work my elbows. I control the handgun with two hands because this is the thing that I have to control. I will not let you take this out of my hands, right? Um, and understand though, uh, there's so many things going on in that fight though. I could be like, oh, this is really a really strong position. Oh, now I'm knocked out. I'm knocked down and my gun's laying there, right? So it, 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 there's, there's so much um, context that we have to identify and train through. But generally speaking, you can follow some hard and fast principles and mitigate most of those things. So I don't know what that position exactly means, but, oh, maybe. You see the question at large. Control. You see the pectoral position for large-breasted women, I think. Yeah, so here's the deal. I'm a large-breasted man. If if there's more mass here, right, I'm not trying to be, you know, crude, the bottom line is it's the same position, right? 
but we're going to adjust the gun to the, our body. So if you, it, it could be a huge guy, huge pack. The point is, I'm going to take the gun. I'm going to retract it as far as my shoulder allows. That's going to be an angle that's a slightly downward angle. And I'm going to push the gun up against my body, utilizing the thumb against the frame to create the distance between my slide and my body. Okay, you can't see it. There's the thumb. That's creating the distance. So if this were much bigger, well, the gun may be pushed out farther because I have more mass. Uh, but the bottom line is it's, the, it's still the same principle and, and technique, um, that, that position itself, if that makes sense. Yep. And Bob says, uh, is there a place to find some additional weapons retention techniques? I don't know, Rich. Is there a place? I think it's called the American Warrior Society dot com. Follow yeah. the link today to get your challenge coin and find all of the retention techniques we've been discussing and much, much more. 14 day trials free on us. Yeah. Well, and Walt is asking about position Sewell tucked retention. I, I don't know what tucked retention is. I think this uh, Walt versus this. Let me tell you, this is not a weapon retention position. This might might be a position where if I wanted to move around a buddy, I might move around a buddy like this. this I will promise you this. This will get you in a certain circumstance where, where someone will take their hand and push the gun like this, and that's all you've got. And it's very easy to grab the handgun and take it out of my hand. This is a completely functionless position in terms of combatives. I've never used this position or seen it effectively used when I'm fighting someone trying to take my gun. I would eliminate that entirely as a close range uh, position when you're fighting someone. You can use it to move around someone if you want to, or I could just take the gun and just move around them or move around them, right? Instead of doing this, right? So I don't use that position a whole lot. I'm not saying I'm opposed to maybe going, hey man, I'm moving to the right here. Can't let me move around you, right? I'm just, I'm just basically unbuilding my grip Rebuilding my grip. Okay. So if that makes sense. No other That's questions. Right? Anything else? That's it, buddy. All right, man. Hey, um, thanks for watching, folks. Please check out the show sponsors, Cool Fire Trainer Precision Holsters, the appendix position. Uh, of course, next week uh, we will be doing the full draw process. I'm going to be talking to you about the concealed carry draw process, specifically the appendix position, but I will also talk about the strong side position. So however you carry your handgun, Bring your gear, carry gear, your belt, your holster, your concealment, whatever else, your cool fire trainer, your surface, pistol, whatever you're going to be training with. Next week is the draw process. We will also talk a little bit about the distance required to draw, so we'll add on to the kind of the live stream we did today as well. Um, that's all I have, folks. Thanks for joining. Looks like we're one hour into it, which is about a perfect time. Have a great day. Get out there and train. Practice this stuff. Remember, if you don't work the skills repetitively over and over again, you're not going to have the skill and the knowledge you need to in the fight. So that's my call to action for you. And until then, train hard.